So anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Joshua Bloom, who's a doctoral candidate in the Department of Sociology here at UCLA. And I, I won't say more importantly, but, but also <laughs> this year he's our pre-doctoral fellow here at the Bunch Center. So we're really pleased to have him here in this research. And today he's going to be talking informally about um, this ongoing research. And the title of the talk is Black Liber Liberation Struggle in the Post-War Decades, Social Movement Theory and the Implications movements today. So with that, I will turn it over to Joshua to lead us in what I'm sure will be a very compelling and stimulating discussion. Thank you, Darnell. So um, we have a small group so we can we can get in uh, more depth and we can talk. Um, there's a few different ways to go um, with this and um, this this talk is based on um, a lot on my doctoral research um, but it's also coming out of several um, projects that I've done um, and um, so it's, it's really trying to pull a lot together and there's a big theoretical component and an engagement with social movement theory and um, I also um, have some sort of more in-depth illustrations of um, particular moments. Um, I want to talk more in depth about the LA Black Panther Party um, as a sort of more detailed um, exemplification of some of the dynamics that I'm talking about. And I also can bring this up to today um, if there are people interested in some of the more contemporary activist um, kind of implications for especially thinking about Occupy um, and the future of Occupy and also the future of tuition on UC campuses. Um, so can I just sort of get a sense of who I'm talking to and um, where people are at? Um, are people, uh, what's that? Hey Alex, how you doing? <laughs> um, are people um, interested in a, a sort of theory and um, social movement theory and thinking in more general terms? Are people more interested in sort of specific stories? And are people more sort of wanting a, an academic um, uh, kind of discussion or a, or a more um, contemporary oriented implications? Uh, any feelings about like these all things? Of all of that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, let me let me try to let me let me try to pull it all together for you. I'm going to go through, and um, we'll we'll do some parts quicker and some parts um, longer. And at any point, if anybody has any comments, questions, things they want to jump in, we can have it be a discussion. Um, so let's start. Um, when and why do people mobilize insurgency to, t to challenge their oppression? Let me say just a couple words about um, what I mean by this question, right? Um, we can think of um, a wide range of different social circumstances where people are subordinated systematically. And that subordination may have to do with the exploitation of their labor. It may have to do with their racial subordination. Um, it may have to do with gender dynamics, but these kinds of oppression are systematic and widespread. They, they spread through a large segment of society and they're enforced systematically through systematic violence. So that when you challenge those particular kinds of roles, there's a consequence and that consequence is enforced by the state and it's enforced violently by the state. Okay, so, so if we think about black liberation struggle, there were hundreds of years of slavery in this country country and decades of Jim Crow. But in the post-war decades, 1945 to 1975, there was a movement in this country, black liberation struggle, that really exemplifies um, for social movements, insurgent social movements, at anywhere and any time, uh, it really has come to exemplify uh, um, uh, what a transformative social movement from below can look like. That people got together and came together and mobilized in a way that challenged and disrupted those established social relations and had a broad transformative impact on society. Um, this movement um, 1945 to 1975, or as I will argue, actually group of movements, Black Liberation Struggle, um, has uh, comprised a major field in history. There's a ton of historians. If you go to OAH, there's like hundreds of people studying Black Liberation Struggle. And it also has motivated and really was the, was the the source of the creation of the field of social movement studies in sociology. Um, and what, what I'm going to engage um, sort of on the more academic end today is especially the debates in sociology about how do we understand what a social movement is and those questions that we started with. When and why do people mobilize insurgency to challenge oppression? 
So um, first, um, I want to say a few things about what black liberation struggle is. Um, it entailed specifically a challenge to racial oppression um, of black people in this country. Um, it peaked during the post-war decades, 1945 to 1975, and it took a range of forms. So this is um, a key sort of um, uh, move that I make theoretically, which is to say that if we really want to understand black liberation struggle in, in the post-war decades, 1945 to 1975, we have to understand that it actually is comprised of several movements. That, you know, a lot of times the civil rights movement, because it has been so much incorporated into the American mythology and the idea that America has about what it is, um, it really overshadows um, in the popular discourse um, the two movements, the one that came before and the one that came after after black anti-colonialism and revolutionary black nationalism. Um, so here's just a, a few uh, descriptive details on these three movements. At the end of World War II, you had major mobilization by black anti-colonialists, um, largely in two forms. One was anti-lynching campaigns like this one in response to the lynching of um, two men and two women in Georgia in 1946, summer of 1946. Um, there were tens of thousands of people, you don't see tens of thousands here, but this was a delegation of women from states all over the country that came together outside the White House. And one thing that's really important about this black anti-colonial period is if you look at the black press, you look at statements of even you know, folks like Walter White, the head of the NAACP, who later is known much more as a moderate, right? But the, the argument here, the argument here is an anti-colonial argument. And it comes right out of Du Bois, right? Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois is really framing this argument, right? The argument is that this, the conditions and the situation in black America is part and parcel of the colonial situation abroad. And the struggles for independence and against colonial domination in Africa are one and the same as the struggle for full dignity and, and, and freedom of black people in the United States. And so there's two things that, that the black anti-colonialists do. They mobilize these major street organizations, these street mobilizations, and their target is the president. If you look, you can see on some of the signs, I don't know if you can read it here, and, um, but, but they're out in front of the White House, and what they're saying is, they're saying, Truman, whose side are you on? Are you for colonialism, or are you against colonialism? And they're taking lynching, and, they're, and then they go, the other thing that they do is they go into the UN, and they go right on the floor of the UN, they use the grassroots uh, networks of the NAACP, hundreds of thousands of signatures, they take this anti-colonial statement, they go into the UN and they say, we call for the UN to internationally intervene militarily against lynching in this country because the president can't protect us. So uh, I'm going to go into the dynamics here a little bit more, but that's black anti-colonialism. Then you have the civil rights movement, the sit-ins, the freedom rides, the community campaigns, the voter rights campaigns, right? I would like to characterize the civil rights movement as being actually, and this is a historical debate, so I'll say a couple of things about this historical debate, but much more uh, contained and specific than it's often thought about by either historian, sociologist, or the general public. I think it's useful to think of the civil rights movement in a very specific way, as nonviolent civil disobedient challenges that disrupt Jim Crow, legal segregation, and de facto disenfranchisement with claims for full participation in citizenship rights. If we think about the civil rights movement as that set of insurgent practices, then that encompasses all the major mobilizations that were really at the heart of the civil rights movement. It encompasses the sit-ins, it encompasses the freedom rides, it encompasses the voting rights campaigns, it encompasses the community campaigns. Each of those mobilizations disrupted and made impossible legal and customary segregation or de facto disenfranchisement by people putting their bodies on the line. 
And the claims that people made in all of those mobilizations were for full citizenship rights, participation in full citizenship rights. And finally, revolutionary black nationalism. Um, the Black Panther Party was at the heart of that. They were by no means the only um, important uh, revolutionary black nationalist organization. You can think of the Revolutionary Action Movement, Republic of New Africa, we could go on and on. But um, the revolutionary black nationalism made a very different kind of claim than the civil rights um, activists and came afterwards, right? The, the, the Black Panther Party really had its heyday from 1968 through 1970, three years. Um, and um, it had a little bit of stuff going on before and a little bit of stuff continuing for a long while after. But that was when it really, I don't know if people realize this, in February of 1968, there was only one chapter of the Black Panther Party, and that was in the Bay Area. In February of 1968, the second chapter opened right here in LA. The third, and a whole bunch more, opened in April of 1968. By the end of 1968, there were at least 25 cities in the country, just a little more than six months, that had hundreds of folks following the model of Huey and Bobby picking up guns and saying, we are going to have a revolutionary movement. We are going to govern our own communities and we are going, we're not going to be pushed around by the police and our struggle is part and parcel with the global struggles everywhere for communities to have self-determination. By the end of 1969, more than 68 cities, every city with a major black population in the country had a uh, large and significant um, mobilization by Black Panther Party chapters, and in many of those cases, um, there were para there was basically parallel government. People having um, their own service programs, whether it was um, community um, food programs, and in many cases also armed confrontations with the police. Um, structural theories. So, so let me say um, a few words about sort of sociological explanations of social movements and I'm going to group them into two camps and I'm going to focus on the ones that talk specifically about black liberation struggle. These are some of the most foundational theories in um, social movement sociology. First are the structural theories. Um, so Piven and Cloward, 1976 Poor People's Movements, they talk about structural crisis. Doug McAdam builds on that, 1982 Political Opportunity Theory. The idea here is if you want to know why and when people buck the trend and stand up at great personal risk and disrupt established social relations to challenge their oppression, that what you need to do is you need to look to the structure, the social structure. And that the reason that there had not been anything like the black liberation struggle before World War II or into that period, there were, there were certainly pieces of resistance all through slavery, but nothing on the scale of black liberation struggle in the post-war years. And that if you want to understand why, what the structural theorists say is you have to look at the way that broader, often economic, but all other kinds of um, processes as well, created contradictions that destabilized the established structures and created the opening for people to mobilize change. So, um, some important parts here. Um, some parts of this argument are, are you know, really helpful. Um, in each wave, um, we see that um, there are some real structural factors in each of those three waves of black liberation struggle. We see people challenging racial oppression as black people, right? People who are participating in the black anti-colonialism, people are participating in the civil rights movement, people are participating in the Black Panther Party are saying, we're sick and tired of being subordinated. We don't want to be ghettoized, we don't want to be treated as second-class citizens, <laughs> we don't want to be pushed around, and that the, the constitution of that racial oppression is, is broadly experienced across American society in a structural way. The second piece, which I think is, is helpful in, um, in this argument uh, that the structuralists make, is that there are some really important things changing in this period. Um, and um, some of the, some in, in broad historical processes, structural processes. So one thing that's changed is that the, the cotton economy, the sharecropper economy, is really in, in decline. 
right? And the arrangement where you have um, Jim Crow basically um, bolstering and supporting uh, the whole southern economy where you have a sharecropper economy and people are kept in line through this sharecropper system, that, that that economic sort of scaffolding and pressure, as well as the alliance with the with northern capitalist interests, has has declined, and there's there's been some loosening of the sort of pressure and support that that was the you know important to the creation of Jim Crow in the first place, and and the transition out of slavery, right? So so that's an important point. Um, a second point. Um, that they make is that internationally there's a Cold War going on and that the US is trying to appeal and say hey you know we're going to be the leaders of this you know free world and so when you have folks like um, India or um, you have the liberation struggles in in Africa um, there is you know you have folks like Nkrumah coming here and he's treated like a second-class citizen right and the US is trying to say hey you should be working with us we're the leaders of the free world and so there's some significant international pressure as well. So I think those are good arguments and I think that those help to understand that there's some changes that are important in setting the context. But the big obvious problem with these arguments, right, is that they take all the agency away from the folks who actually made the movement. <laughs> and they also just don't they just don't, when you look at the details, they also just don't hold water. If you look across the three movements that we talked about in the three moments, there's actually these waves, strong waves and peaks. If you look after the black anti-colonial movement, there were then five um, to eight years, depending on exactly how you count it, where there was very little um, black insurgent mobilization. And cotton, the decline of the cotton economy and the Cold War were, were going through, you know, were, were brewing through that whole period. So there's no good explanation of the character or the timing um, and extent of mobilization. Um, there's, there's a second school that's important here, and these are more endogenous organization theories. So two key people here are Alden Morris and Charles Payne. Alden Morris basically says, look, that, you know, people want to run around and say, oh, it's all about what kinds of outside resources people get or these structural factors, but if you really want to understand how um, the civil rights movement was created, right, origins of the civil rights movement, you have to understand that the, the endogenous, indigenous, right, he calls them indigenous, um, but they're, they're related, right, the indigenous um, organizations, the black church mostly, right, and the networks within the black community had built strength and power and were able to mobilize a challenge, right? And Charles Payne has a slightly different argument, which is in part addressing some of the critiques that have been uh, leveled against Alden Morris. And what he says is, it's, it's the organizations, but even more than the organizations, it's the tradition of organizing. It's the organizing tradition. It's, it's people working with each other to build networks to advance this broader vision of uh, freedom, right? Black liberation. Right, and that as those networks and as that project is cultivated, then people are able to build the movement. Right, there's some real strength to this um, to this perspective, and it's an important corrective to the structuralist one. But there are some some important limitations as well. First of all. Um, if you look at the timing of organizational strength, right, and you look at the organizations, let's take the civil rights movement, the organizations that were crucial in really mobilizing nonviolent civil disobedience and insurgent mobilization in the civil rights movement, SNCC, we think of SNCC. SNCC was born in 1960. And that became the organization that conducted the most direct act, nonviolent direct action, right? So that came after, right? CORE was around, but it was small and not very influential. It became very important and a big influential organization once there was a movement, right? Um, we think of SCLC, again, you know, a similar trajectory, right? So, so there's, there's a mismatch here, right? These are clearly important networks and important resources. 
but there's not an independent effect where the strength of the organization is driving the level of mobilization. That's not the way it's working. And the problem with what these theoreticians have done, you know, and, and the sort of what's called political process theory, and a lot of people are critical of it, but there hasn't been anything that's really come back, is they just layer these things on top of each other. So they say, okay, if we have sort of the lack of constraint in society, you know, and there's these structural opportunities or a stru structural crisis, and there's organizational strength, then you add these things together and you get a movement. And that doesn't really work out either correlationally, but it also doesn't explain the whens and the, and the whys and the hows when you look at the nitty gritty. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to propose um, a different way of thinking about this. Um, and I'm going to go through a theoretical framework for thinking about it, um, and then I'm going to look at these three moments, and then I was going to do a more in-depth thing with the Black Panther Party, um, specifically the LA um, Black Panther Party. Um, so, um, and then draw some conclusions for today. So that's, that's a lot. Let me, um, how are people feeling? Theory heavy or, or theory light? Should, should we? Theory heavy? Go theory heavy? No. No. no, I'm doing theory heavy? Okay, I'll, I'll do theory light and we'll get, we'll get to more of the concretes. I still want the punchline though, and, you know, of the, the critique and now your... your here's, here's the punchline. The punchline is, the punchline is this, is that um, when people find ways of disrupting established social relations, the repression of which draws a lot of people to support them, then you got a movement. That's the punchline. So that what happens is, is that that's, that's situation specific. If I go up, or somebody else goes up, right, I'm, I'm not black, but um, I could say I'm going to do it for my movement. But somebody black goes up today, or I go up, or anybody else goes up and say, I'm going to be Bobby and Huey, and I'm going to pick up a gun, and I'm going to do armed self-defense against the police, and I'm going to organize people. It doesn't matter how good an organizer you are, you're going to get yourself killed. Right? Because the times are different. Now, that doesn't mean that these are not times for a movement. What it means is these are not times for that movement. If I go and I say, I'm going to create racial justice by doing a sit-in, and I go to a business that only employs almost all white people and maybe one black person or something, and I say, I'm going to go do a sit-in, right, and I'm going to create racial justice, I'm just going to get myself arrested. I'm not, I'm not going to create a movement, because the conditions under which the sit-in worked we're very different. Let me say a little bit, about, I'll, I'll skip this general theoretical chart which breaks that down in more detail, but let me say a little bit about, and I'll skip the black anti-colonialism, but people know a little bit about the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Panther Party. So let me say a little bit about what, how that dynamic worked in those two. Can I just interject quickly? Yeah. I mean, for theory boring people who don't want theory, um, can you relate this to, um, say, some of the factor theories that are used to explain collective behavior and, and how what you're talking about may be similar to or different from those types of models? Yeah, what I'm arguing is is that it isn't, you cannot explain mobilization by some laundry list of, mm -hmm. of factors or mm -hmm. variables. That what you have to understand is the relationship <laughs> between the practice and the context. Okay. And that it's a particular kind of relationship that you can generalize. Okay? okay? Um, so if we look at the civil rights movement, right, what people are doing is nonviolent civil disobedience. They're disrupting, but they're disrupting a very specific target, and that's Jim Crow. Not only are they disrupting Jim Crow, but what happens is, is that they're disrupting Jim Crow with claims for participation in full citizenship rights in a moment where those claims and that kind of disruption are very hard to repress. So if you look at the 19, who, who's heard of the 1919 Elaine Massacre? 1919 Elaine, Elaine Arkansas, a few, people, a few black folks try to organize just as sharecroppers, <laughs> right? They're trying to challenge this, you know, support and share. They organize just a meeting, right? And, you know, some Klan folks come and start shooting in. A few of them have guns. They shoot back. Somebody gets killed. A white guy gets killed. They round up every black person in the county and kill like three or four hundred of them. And the National Guard participates in this, 
right? So these are the conditions in 1919, right? That's the conditions. If you're black living under Jim Crow and you challenge the authority of racial subordination, you are lynched, right? There's a very different, so, so doing a sit-in at a lunch counter in 1919 isn't the winning strategy, right? Doing a sit-in at a lunch counter in 1919 gets you killed. But there's something very different that's going on in Greensboro, right? Because the conditions with both moderate black and more established black leaders and institutions, as well as a range of non-black allies, <laughs> as well as a range of non-black uh, non and black allies outside of the area. <laughs> Students coming down from the north, all kinds of liberals who have some commitments, who are seeing this on TV for the first time, and are saying, hey, you know, we can't have people being beaten up and had dogs sicked on them and murdered for trying to just buy a sandwich or vote, right? And the federal government in particular is put in a very compromising position because the federal government's out there trying to say to the Nkrumahs and all these other people, we are the leaders of the free world. And then you have folks trying to buy a sandwich getting, you know, beaten up and folks trying to challenge that getting, you know, if you look at Freedom Summer and, you know, or all kinds of folks in the civil rights movement get killed for their, for their activities, right? These, these are very embarrassing to the federal government as it tries to, um, as it tries to make a claim for, for world leadership. And so you have a context, a specific context, in which the practices of nonviolent civil disobedience against Jim Crow with claims for full participation in citizenship rights wins. It can't be easily repressed because the traditional repression, that, those, that systematic violent repression of challenges to subordination, it can't be sustained against that particular challenge. Now, if those students in Greensboro had picked up guns and stormed into the Woolworth and said, give me a, a sandwich, motherfucker, right? Excuse my language, but right in the Panther tone, right? That, that, that wouldn't have spread throughout every city in the South in three months. In three months after February 1st, 1960, every city in the South outside of, of Mississippi had had a, had had a sit-in, at least one sit-in, right? And many of those were not organized by any formal network. They were people seeing it, recognizing the power of it, and moving forward with it, right? So that if you, if you have if you have lived under a certain form of oppression but you don't have any way to challenge it, then you'd just be suicidal to get up and lay your life down on the, you'd be laying your life down to lay your life down on the line individually with no hope of support. But if, and not everybody's gonna get up and get beat up for, for justice, but if you can stand up against some oppression that has systematically shaped your life, and there's all kinds of folks that are coming and gonna back you, then you can win. And then other people see it and they do it too. And so it spreads. So that's the theoretical kind of framework. Are there questions about the theoretical argument? Let me do this with the Panthers and some pictures. Let's start with the Watts riots, Watts Rebellion, uh, I prefer. Um, and here you see, you know, folks have been brutalized in L this is LA, right? So folks have been brutalized by the LAPD. Um, and, um, you know, here they're saying we're not going to take anymore. And you have to remember this is in the context of the end of the Civil Rights Movement, right? So the Civil Rights Movement has been very, very effective by 1965, summer 1965, at dismantling Jim Crow and at creating um, some kind of legal framework for uh, eliminating legal segregation, customary segregation, made good inroads into voting rights. But what has it done for residents of the ghetto? In the West, in the North, or in the South for that matter? What has it done? N not much. Not much. Right? And in, in the cities, 
the, the municipalities have taken a containment approach, right? So they've said, okay, we've got all these, you know, black populations that we basically <laughs> attracted during the world wars to do industrial jobs. A lot of those jobs have gone out of the neighborhoods. There's been white flight. We're going to contain that. We're going to just hold that pressure in with tough police and we're going to have our nice comfortable life. Let them deal with their squalor, right? So there's this ghettoization process. People are poor. Those industrial jobs have gone. And you've got these police that are just beating everybody up, right? If you step out of line or you look at them the wrong way, right? And so people start to rebel, especially in the context of a real promise of redress of the civil rights movement, okay? So what happens is that by 1966, 67, in LA, you have a whole range of organizations really growing out of the Watts Rebellion and focused in on, on and I, I wish I had a picture of the Black Congress building, but focusing on the Black Congress building, right, trying to figure out what does black power mean. Stokely Carmichael comes up with the phrase, right, coming out of SNCC. He was one of the SNCC leaders, right, and he's the younger generation, and he challenges King. He says, this isn't about, you know, civil rights anymore. It's not doing anything for us. We can't get any further with this civil rights. This is about black power. We need black power. So that phrase really takes off in the cities of the North and West because people feel like, yeah, that speaks to what I'm feeling, that speaks to what I need, right? But what does it mean? And there's a hundred different answers to that and nobody really has any leverage. So if you look at the, the Black Congress in 1966, 1967, there's a million organizations all trying to figure something out, but nobody really has any, any following on a large scale and they're not, they don't have any power. Right? They have the idea, but they don't really have any power. Try and that's not just here in LA. Um, that's all over. October 1967, the, the Black Panther Party has gotten its start. And in the, in the North, Bobby Seale and, and Huey Newton um, start the organization. And they, what they do is they actually innovate something, building off of what a group down here called CAP had done with the Community Alert Patrol, patrolling the police. But they take arms, they study the law, and they say, we're going to be within the law, but we're going to be armed, and we're not going to let police push anybody around. And they're able to build this following, right? A small following. In October 68, Huey Newton, there's a confrontation with the police. Huey Newton goes to prison. He's actually shot also. One of the police officers, white police officer John Fry, is killed. And the Black Panther Party organizes the Free Huey campaign. The argument of the Free Huey campaign is an anti-imperialist argument. The argument is not Huey is not guilty. That's not the argument. The argument is your court system has no right to judge Huey because we are a colony within the mother country and we are going to have our own self-governance and our own independence. So you need to let Huey free. Free Huey or the sky is the limit. That's the argument of the Free Huey campaign. And it's gaining a lot of traction. A lot of people are feeling what people were feeling in the Watts Rebellion. And they're saying, yeah, that's, you know, that's talking to me. And so you see here, and this is quite an interesting, I actually think this is the Bay Area, not the LA one, but it was both. They were, they were up here and down there, and there's not good pictures of them. But if you look on the right, that's Bunchy Carter. Then um, you have the SNCC leaders, James Foreman, Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael. Then Huey's missing because uh, he's in prison. Uh, Bobby Seal, um, that's a rank and file Panther, uh, or uh, not really rank and file, but he's a Panther member. Um, and then you have actually Ron Dellums. Um, but. Um, that's Ron and Ian? Yeah. But um, I don't know who the kid is. But. Um, is from the um, Black Panther newspaper. But the um, SNCC has caught fire with this phrase black power, but they don't know what it means. And in Huey, they see, they see, they see that there's something there. They see what the Panthers call brothers on the block coming off the streets and saying, we, we are going to participate in this. We are going to stand up. We want to, we want to be like Huey and Bobby. We want to stand up. We don't want to be pushed around. We want to stand up to the police and we want to govern our own destinies. Right? So we want to be Panthers. And the SNCC leaders see that. They come down to LA. Octo um, well, this is actually in 68, early 68, Huey's, um, Huey's confrontation with Fry is in October of 67. This is February of 68. They come down here. Bunchy Carter um, becomes 
um, the leader of the first Black Panther Party chapter outside of the Bay Area, and the Black Panther Party in LA is born. Um, you all know these folks, right? This is Bunchy on the left and John Huggins on the right. Um, important um, leaders that grow out of this. The Black Panther Party is still very small here in um, in LA, um, but they're you know they're building they're building a small following. They really are starting to they move out of the Black Congress building. This becomes of the organizations in the Black Congress, it becomes the organization that has more real teeth because they, they have a program, right? They're saying, let's free Huey. They've had some examples of really standing up to the police. They've been able to really gain some, some traction, some following. And then what, what happens is the, um, the FBI, the federal government generally, but the COINTELPRO specifically um, targets the, um, the Black Panther Party and especially the, these leaders of the Southern California Black Panther Party um, and helps to instigate some conflicts um, with a rival organization and um, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins are, are killed right here uh, next door in, in Campbell Hall. And that, that rival, is that the yes organization? Yeah. And there's all kinds, what we don't have is a smoking gun about what exact direct orchestration the FBI may have had in planning the specific assassination. It may have, it may not. There's all kinds of reasons to believe that it might have. The people who have done jail time, there's some questions about how involved they really were. The people who probably were very involved in directly killing them are sort of disappeared somehow. And there's, there's all kinds of sort of issues there. And you know, Scott Brown could talk more in detail about that. But what's very, very clear and wasn't at the time, but has been since 76 in the church committee hearings, is the intensity of the intentional efforts by the federal government to create the violent conflict between us and the Panthers. That's, that's perfectly clear. After, it's only after John and Bunchy are killed that you get the breakfast programs. <coughs> Right? It's only in 1969 anywhere that the Black Panther Party creates breakfast programs. Those develop here. The party grows considerably in Los Angeles to the extent that in December of that year, when hundreds of um, the first SWAT team ever designed specifically for this purpose, um, police working with federal agents, storm with, with military equipment, storm the Black Panther office, raid the Black Panther office, there's a, there's a mini war. It's like a five, have people seen videos of this? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's like a, it's a war. They have tanks and, you know, or armored vehicles of some sort. Machine guns are like dropping bombs on the roof and trying to get in through the roof. There's hundreds of these, you know, SWAT, and, and the Panthers are holding them off, right? Um, this is a pretty sophisticated organization at that point. It has a lot more members than it had in January, and they've really reinforced, and, and part of what's happened is that They've given credibility to their vision of insurgency by A, making business as usual impossible to maintain. Business as usual cannot continue when you have Black Panther Party members mobilizing, carrying arms, saying we're going to govern ourselves and we're going to defend ourselves against the police. There's a whole series of shootouts between police and Panthers during this period, right? Leading up to this, right? So this is not this is not something that that the city government or the federal government can ignore. They are making status quo arrangements of power impossible. But they're not just doing that. If they were just doing that, they would have just been wiped out and we never would have heard of them. What they've done is they've situated their politics in a way that there's a lot of folks who feel threatened when they're repressed. So in the same way that the LA Panthers feel threatened when Huey Newton is incarcerated and they feel like they're, they share a common cause with him because they've been beat, beat up by the cops a, a dozen times too, right? And they're living in the same squalor and conditions. There's also a whole lot of other people who aren't necessarily the insurgents who support them 
these are some of the um, panthers in that shootout. Um, but if you look at this picture, this is a picture, there were 10,000 people turned out. This is a close-up of part of the crowd. Um, and um, do these look like, and now some of them might, but do these all look like Black Panther Party members who are going to pick up guns and, and, and stand up against the police? Hey Josh, where, where was that shootout? What part of that? 41st and Central. 41st uh, and Central. So you see there's, there's a number of older people, there's a whole range of ages, there looks like there's some class differences going on here, right? These are mostly black allies here in this, in this picture, right? But these are not all insurgents. There's all kinds of people who feel threatened by the repression of the Panthers and feel something, uh, some attachment to the promise of what the, what the Panthers are um, suggesting. That they feel like, hey, we still can't get into college, we don't have a good job, we're still living in the ghetto, right? And not only that, uh, and here's, here's a picture of a few more, this is the same rally. There's a storm in the Hall of Justice downtown. You see they're carrying the pictures of Huey and Bobby, right? This is following the shootout in, in December 69, right? Um, but it's not, just, it's not just moderate blacks and other, other black folks, right? Part of the Panthers' politics, and this is crucial from the start, is to say we are part and parcel of this global struggle against imperialism for community self-determination. So here in this picture you've got brown berets in the background and Asian American activists in the foreground saying, this is, this is part of our struggle. Women's liberation. Oftentimes you hear a lot of nonsense about, you know, the, how the party was all about, you know. Now, there were certainly, there was certainly sexism in the party. The thing is, is it's hard to find a part of society where there isn't sexism. And, and some of that, and some of the black, you know, if you look at the US organization, you know, some real problems, you know, there. I mean, Karanga went to jail around some of that stuff. But um, the, the Black Panther Party was far from perfect in its redress of gender dynamics. But, it, but what is so distorted in the attacks on the party from that a avenue is they were well ahead of the mainstream in terms of pushing the debate and the discussion. And they took very strong positions on women's liberation and on gay liberation, believe it or not. And their argument was, hey, this, these are all different forms of oppression. And we share a common struggle. So this is a mobilization for, this is not in LA, this is in New Haven for Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins. And this is a women's liberation group that's supporting the Black Panther Party. Here's David Hilliard, um, also in, in New Haven. If you look on the left, that's Tom Hayden, Dave Dillinger, Abby Hoffman, right? SDS, the largest student organization against the war. And most all of the folks really driving the draft resistance and the anti-imperialist movement look to the Panthers. The SDS declared the Black Panther Party the vanguard of our common struggle in 1968, right? So, so here you have, um, here you have massive mobilization. These are a whole bunch of middle class white Yale students in a rally in support of the Black Panther Party. May Day 1970, New Haven, yeah. Sweden, Free Bobby. <coughs> this is in Algiers, in the Vietnamese Embassy, the <coughs> National Liberation Front of Vietnam. Said, you are Black Panthers, we are Yellow Panthers. Zhao Enlai, the Premier of China, Huey Newton. So, what, what the Black Panther Party did is that they figured out a politics that was created an insurgent source of power. There's other way, there's other kinds of movements, right? If we think of a movement as people mobilizing with the promise of liberation from a form of shared oppression, there's plenty of movements where people do just get together and try to sort of build networks and support. And, and those sometimes have some very significant effects. But I, I, I'm arguing that and this is back to theory for a minute, to make this last point um, about, about Occupy, um, which, you know, I'll open it up and see if we have questions, but let me make this last theoretical point. Um, and the, um, the last, the, the, the sort of last theoretical point here is that, um, 
people don't always have the power to challenge the structural oppression just by working together. You know, a clipboard and going door to door or talking to your friends or working the network or coming together and trying to get on the same page, that can go so far. But in history, a lot of times, transformation comes when people do take a sacrifice and put themselves on the line and challenge and disrupt the way that things are structured. And that was the power that the Black Panther Party was, was, was tapping. And, what, and that was the power that the Civil Rights Movement was tapping. And that was the power that the black anti-colonialists were tapping. And what they did is they were able to get a source of power through disruption that gave them a, a, a leverage point to negotiate with. They were not they were making it impossible for the status quo to continue. But to be able to sustain that, they had to do it in a way that lots of other people who weren't necessarily going to put their own lives on the line would say, yeah, we support that too. And so in each of these movements, in a different way, that's what you find, is that activists created a set of insurgent practices that made the status quo impossible to continue while drawing a lot of support from other people who weren't necessarily going to put themselves online in the same way. And that created a source of power that was transformative in all of these movements. Um, so are there, I, I'm going to stop. I can bring this to Occupy if people are interested, but um, let me just open it up and see if there are any uh, last questions or comments or things people want to talk about. Well, why don't we, um, I have a question. Um, it's very interesting the way you kind of work through um, these different movements and, and the different periods um, in which they're sort of um, uh, embedded. Um, if we kind of fast forward to where, where we are today and think about the context that we're confronting now, and, you, and you've alluded to the Occupy movement a number of times, I'm just curious to kind of get your read on you know, how successful that movement has been thus far in terms of developing an insurgent um, sort of practice that, you know, at least for a time was disrupting the status quo, or maybe, you know, maybe we can, I, I guess, debate as to how disruptive it really was or is. Um, but then the, the, whole, the whole idea of ideas, I guess, you know, and, and the role that ideas play in all of these movements and in um, the process by which you disrupt the status quo and then ultimately convince other people to join because the idea resonates with where they are politically, materially, or whatever, you know. And I'm thinking, of course, of, I mean, I guess at a very, very generic level, the whole idea of, like, elective affinity or something, you know, like, when these things just kind of come together in the moment, you know, and you can't necessarily predict, you know, when that moment will be. Um, but, um, and so there may be some serendipity involved. I mean, it's kind of, it, it, you know, it's not always sure. clear whether, like you said, a movement's going to succeed or take off or be sustainable, but, um, Thinking of all these things I've just thrown out, where do you see the Occupy movement and, and kind of where it's been and possibly where it may be headed? Yeah, and there are, there are, two, there are two questions there, right? I mean, one is this concrete one about, about Occupy. i just say a couple words about the theoretical one that you set it up with. I mean, that's exactly the point, right? Is that my argument is that it all revolves around the practice. Mm -hmm. And there's some real technology in that. So I think that the ideas and sort of the schematic analysis, you can't capture the practice with just ideas alone. And it's something that it evolves. It evolves. And what I do with the Black Panther Party in my book on the Black Panther Party is I look at the way very specifically that the practice evolves and how that develops. But there's a technology in that practice, right? And, the, and, and so the practice is often taken for granted. But what I'm arguing is that in insurgent social movements, that's what an insurgent social movement is. It's the proliferation of a set of practices, a set of tactics, but also a way of thinking about it, claims, in some cases, organizational structures that other people can take up. So when you get that recipe right, then other people take it up. That's what happened with the sit-ins. Right. At that moment, February 1st, 1960, right, it was the right recipe. And then you have every city in the South people organizing a similar mobilization. Right? With the Black Panther Party, same thing. February of 1968, um, it's just Bay Area and LA. By the end of the year, it's like 25 cities. By the end of the next year, it's 68 cities, right? And most of those people are not organized. You have to realize that. It's not like the Black Panther Party is going out and organizing chapters. Everybody wants to be a Black Panther member. 
Right. Everybody's coming to them. They're saying, I can't answer these calls. Here's what you, you got to jump through these 10 hoops if you want to even talk about being a Black Panther member, right? Or a chapter. So that's the general answer. In terms of Occupy, I would call Occupy a proto movement. Okay. And I think that we're right at the cusp. And things right now are obviously not sort of on the upward take, but I think that we're in a particular position, and I'm not going to get to show you the video, but let me put this on the last slide here, and this is my prediction. If the students on the UC campuses win the battle to put the tents up, then we will win the war. And here, here's what I think is going on with Occupy. I think that we had this major crisis which affected so many people across society. It was the financial crisis with the housing crisis and then how that spread out. And the folks who generated that got the bailout. Mm -hmm. They got a trillion dollars in bailout money. Right? And what did everybody else get? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> right? Getting We're getting cuts. <laughs> We're getting austerity. <laughs> Look at how hard the budget is for the Bunch Center. Look at what's happening for, you know, working class kids, you know, here at the University of California. People are getting pushed out, you know. They're talking about are we going to privatize, basically, right? And so the the... You know, there's so many people who are mad about this at every level of society. And what happened was that Occupy broke through that. And it broke through that in a, in a very interesting way. And I think people miss it. There's so much debate about the tents. I think the brilliance of the tents was twofold. One is it was only a tiny, tiny step from free speech. So it wasn't that disruptive. How much, how much of a big deal is it if you have some tent in a public park? Is that going to stop anybody from going to work? Is it going to stop anybody from going to school? You know, what's the big deal, right? So that's the first thing, is that it wasn't that. But what it did is it created a base of operations for an insurgency that was about the 99% that everybody could relate to. So what's the threat? The threat is what happened in Oakland at the port. The threat is, is that if you have the tents, and, and that's not sustainable, on its own, right? It's, it's clear that you cannot shut down the Port of Oakland at this point and keep it shut down, right? For some kind of Occupy argument. But what happens is when you have the tents, you have all these folks who are just constantly 24-7 strategizing how to shut down the Port of Oakland and every other thing. And everybody is upset about the situation because everybody's getting hurt by it. So, so what happened is, is that the, the folks who are running the police departments and the city governments, they recognized this. Think about the anti-apartheid movement. Once those tents went up on the big college campuses and they said, we want divestment, we don't want to have anything to do with apartheid, those tents stayed up until apartheid came down. Because you had the same thing, a permanent base of operations. Once the tents go up on college campuses and it's tied to what everybody can agree with, which is that you know, it's, in the, it's in the state charter. Students of California are supposed to be able to have an affordable top class education. And that mandate is getting gutted because the folks who created the financial crisis got bailed out and we didn't. And everybody knows that on some level. So the, what, what, what the state has done in various forms and branches has been brilliant and it's something that they did to the, to the party, although it took a lot of concessions in the, in, the, in the case of the Black Panther Party as well, but they haven't had to make that many concessions yet. They slowed down a little. You, you see how they slowed down on the, on, the, on the tuition increases here at UC when the Occupy was warming up, right? Mm -hmm. Believe me, if it doesn't warm up again, we're going to see those tuition increases in the months to come, right? And we're going to see the cuts, right? 6% increase right now. <laughs> See, you know, so it's not going to take them long to come back to that. But, but if the tents are up, they're not going to be talking about that. Because then you have a permanent base of folks who are figuring out how do we shut things down. And they can't do, so that was the video I wanted to show, right? They can't get away with this. Have you, has everybody seen this? Can we see it? The sound isn't working somehow. Do you know how to get the sound to? Yeah, the speakers are right there. I have no power for some reason. So where, where is this? Power. Sorry. Oh, the thing fell out? So, so where is the, where is the video? Person. What's that? Where is the video? It's at Berkeley. It's Berkeley, what? Yeah. There's a, there's a great... Uh, it was a great Davis one too, but That's what I, was wondering. Yeah. I saw the Davis one. This one, I think, was in some ways even more 
Uh, indicative, you got it? Yes. Let's try this. See. It's just, it's just a minute and a half. These are Berkeley students trying to have their tent on the campus of the University of California. This is the headquarters of free speech, the world headquarters of free speech. Yeah, they say you can't have your tents. Yeah. But don't think that these that these police are just acting on their own. This is what they're told to do. Mm -hmm. But they follow law. Of course. I mean they did the same thing here with the Regent Smith mm -hmm. like two years ago. So you, you get the point of this, it's, all, it's just more of the same. But the, um, the, the point is, is that when this happened and when Davis happened, everybody was up in arms, right? And if you think about in November 2009 when there was the tuition protests and this kind of stuff happened, what the first time ever Governor Schwarzenegger jumps up and says, we're going to put more funding into schools than prisons. You remember that? Mm -hmm. They know they can't get away with this. They know they can't get away with this. Because this is the future of California. And everybody has been hurt by the bailout. Right? But the reason that they're doing this is because they can't afford to have the tents on campus and they know it. If you have the tents on campus, then you're going to have students doing disruptive activities from here until the tuition is brought back to, you know, 2000 and pre-crisis levels, right? And until everything's fully funded and until the folks who, be, right? So those tents are going to stay, as, so they know they can't have that. And what they've done with Occupy, which has been very successful, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, if people want to stay and talk after, I'm happy to stay. But what they've done with Occupy is they've criminalized it. Mm -hmm. So they've said this is a bunch of homeless people, it's a health threat, right? And they're just, you know, all these crazy homeless people and the people are getting killed and this is dangerous and all this stuff. And they don't have an agenda and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they're talking about. And that's why this is so especially dangerous to the, to the uh, status quo to have it on campus is because A, it's much harder to criminalize. Everybody, this is everybody's children. And B, the demands are clear. People got to be able to go to school. Right? So, again, uh, if the tents go up on campus, that's my prediction and where I want to leave it. If we win the battle, if somebody fights and pushes through and the tents go up on campus, they're not going to go down until there's some major changes in the society. So, thank you. Well, thank you. They won't put the tents up until fall quarter. <laughs>